when the market crashed in 2008, we didn't have anybody call us on the phone about what am I going to do with my money? And I lost, you know, 20, 30, 40%. I'm like, because they didn't for one, but you know, two, they're like, they just knew the plan. When you have the plan in place, you can have an incredible peace of mind for the future. Hey there, everybody. It's Dr. Glenn Krieger here with another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. Today, we have a fellow orthodontist who also is going to talk a little bit about some wise money moves that you can make in your life. And so uh, please, everybody out there, warm welcome. Put your hands together and give a warm round of applause to Dr. Mart McClellan. Welcome, Mart. Hi, everybody. Mart is here. I've gotten to know him much better in the last, oh, six months or so, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But what I really want to talk about, there's a few really good topics I want to bring up today about a few things. Number one, financial planning, because we're going to get into that. You've got a really, really good background in that. And uh, cryptocurrency, NFT stuff, because you and I, we joke a lot about that. We have some good conversations there, and you're very knowledgeable on it. Orthodontics, of course, and not least, last but certainly not least, is not just the OSO component, which everybody's talking about now, but the role it might play in your life in a good or a bad way in terms of not only how do I accumulate wealth, but you know, if I end up working for an OSO and I've got an equity position and I end up making three, five, 10, 12, 20 million dollars, what's the right thing to do with it at that point, right? Is it enough? Is it not enough? And we'll, we'll get into all of that. So let's just start first with tell everybody a little bit about, you know, where'd you come from? What's your background? How'd you end up being where you are today? Yeah, well, thanks Glenn for having me. Uh, it's a true pleasure. Uh, actually, I was born in Germany. Uh, my dad worked for IBM. IBM stands for I've Been Moved. And uh, <laughs> I grew up all over the country. I uh, grew up in West Virginia, then finished up in Connecticut. And then uh, when I was going to uh, high school, I decided, hey, I wanted to enter the health professions. And I went off to a small school in Indiana called DePaul University and uh, wanted to be a doctor at the time, quite frankly. And then they had these really cool programs at the school where you go on uh, things called winter term and mission. And so I did mission projects in Kenya and in Guatemala. Wow. Because at that time, I was exposed to an or uh, oral surgeon on the trip who uh, showed me what dentistry is all about. And I didn't even know what dentistry was at the time. And so it was those mission projects in Africa that really end in Central America that exposed me to dentistry and got me involved in the profession I'm in today. But then in dental school, I went to Northwestern Dental School out of DePaul. And then I was asked to go back on these mission trips to the Amazon rainforest as one of the quote doctors. I really wasn't have a degree yet, but they needed people to work. So I pulled a lot of teeth on that trip in the, in the, in the rainforest. And then I realized, Hey, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. I go, I, I love oral surgery, but not enough to do it. And that's where I made the transition to decide to go to orthodontics. And I went to university of Michigan and I was blessed to have uh, Jim McNair as my chairman on the front end. Then halfway through my program, Lyle Johnson came on board and uh, it was just a wonderful, you know, two people, two, two titans of orthodontics who really thought differently, but it really gave me a, a wonderful perspective on how to open your mind to different ways of treating patients. Then I graduated uh, ortho. I became partners with Lee Graber. A lot of, a lot of you people know Lee Graber. Read and, the textbook. Uh, he got the textbook right. And my practice right now is in the building that he built. And so, um, yeah, and I got out and just did a normal associate thing for a couple of years and became partners with Lee. And uh, yeah, and that was just sort of my, my journey into uh, orthodontics. Right on. And if I'm not mistaken, you've been practicing somewhere close to 30 years now, right? Yeah. 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 I graduated in 93. Right on. So talk to us a little bit about your practice because it's always nice when you, I mean, it's kind of funny. Usually when I have an orthodontist on here, we're talking about a product, we're talking about a system or a policy they've in implemented or some really cool area of their practice. In your case, the conversation is going to focus a lot more on money uh, and money management and ideas that people haven't ever really heard. So let's dive into your practice just a little bit. Tell everybody a little bit about your practice um, in general terms. How big is it? You know, how many how many people you have working with you? How many locations yeah. do you have? Do you have any partners or associates? We started out initially with two practices, Lee and I, and then we grew to three practices. Then we spun one off with one of my one of my friends, and uh, my team at the time was around fifteen to sixteen uh, people. And then uh, Lee and I, we uh, we split up because his daughter came on board and they, they took one of the practice, I took the other. So my team was essentially cut in half. So I got an eight member team now, essentially. And um, uh, I've been doing self-ligating uh, orthodontics gosh, since 2003 or 2004. How dare you? Don't say that out loud, okay? No, I know. It's terrible. You're just talking to me. Nobody else is listening. Okay? I know. Shh. <laughs> 
but yeah, that's 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 been that's been sort of my motto. I I always love you know office efficiencies and how to you know squeeze out the most from my my team and you know getting the patients done in the most efficient manner. And, and I felt that was the, the best fit for me personally. Yeah. Right on. By the way, you know it's kind of a funny aside that I it, you've been around a little while in orthodontics. You and I have been practicing literally almost exactly the same amount of time. Just you've done three times or four times the amount of ortho that I have. But I graduated in 1992 from dental school, so we've been practicing roughly the same. What's really funny is, you know, when I first came out of ortho residency, um, the idea of self-ligating was this big hot button issue. Everybody was arguing self-ligating this, and yeah. like now, if only we argued over self-ligating, like that would be like the dis- <laughs> like nobody. Right. I don't hear anybody debate, you know, self-ligating versus twin anymore. Now no. it's like, there's like eight other things that have replaced it since then that people debate over. Isn't it kind of interesting how we're so passionately att- attached to an argument that five years later doesn't even matter anymore? No, it's so true. I mean, it was such a heated thing where you, are you this person? It was, it was almost, you were, it was sacrilege almost to sort of go down that hole. And now it's, it's just like almost normal protocol now. So it's, yeah. it is, it is changed. I mean, that's the thing about our profession too. It's just changing and accelerating at such a rapid pace. It's just it's, it's amazing you know, trying to keep up with it all. It really is yeah. challenging. And if we just accept the fact that no matter what the discussion, or, or again, the hot button issue is, that the person on the other side of the phone or the computer now uh, is a, probably a really good person. And yeah. the fact that they like to do self-ligating or airway-centered orthodontics or joined an OSO or dealt with TMJ and occlusion or Roth or whatever you want to add to it, they're probably a really good person who's trying to do the best they can. And there are exceptions, but like, you know, it's so nice when you deal from a position of, of empathy, respect, kindness, happiness, you can have some great conversations, right? And- oh, absolutely. It's just one of those things that I wish the whole world would be, be more open to that, right? I mean, we're sort of in this very divisive world that there's no reason for it, you know, whether it's self-ligating versus twin, you know, or the political spectrums, you know, there's no reason we all can't engage and, and, and share our thoughts in a, in a respectful manner and, uh, and, and move on. Yeah. I, I mean, let's get into vaccines, you bastard. I'm kidding. I kid. I kid. It is, but it is true. I mean, it, that is such a, a polarizing discussion. It's like, well, it doesn't really need to be, but here no. we are, you know? Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about the other side of your life because you're an orthodontist, uh, on one side, how many days a week would you say you work in doing clinical? I work ortho? three. I work three in ortho. So I'm still, okay. I'm still very fully. I love orthodontics. I, it is one of the most blessed professions ever created by by by, by anyone. It's incredible. Yeah. I love That's it. Great. Who was it? Uh, who created the bandeau? You remember the bandeau? Uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. You, you remember you had to take ortho history, and there was yeah. the, there was the bandeau that was created <laughs> uh, with the leather straps that were dipped in water then oh, tied right, the right. <laughs> right i think that's who invented orthodont or the mesopotamians or so, so, mesopotamians or something way deep yeah, yeah yeah but um let's talk about the other part of your life that takes up probably eight times more time which yeah. is your financial advisory firm first a shameless plug feel uh, for everybody out there who wants to know i have zero financial interest in your company right i want to be crystal clear about that uh, I get no commissions. I get nothing if people come to you. I'm just bringing this out so people can learn more because there's some really cool stuff you're about to hear, folks. So just keep listening. But tell everybody about the name of it, what it is, how did it come about, and how did you end up an orthodontist uh, dealing with a financial advisory firm? Yeah, that's a great question. I um, never in a million years thought I'd be doing this type of work with my friends and colleagues in, in dentistry. But uh, when I got out of school at Michigan, I was just, you're sort of thrown at the wolves. You really don't know how to manage your money, what to do with your money. And so I had sort of the traditional advisors help me here and there. And it just wasn't working. I just, I just didn't understand, you know, why my money wasn't doing better. And so uh, I was actually referred to uh, this gentleman who's now my partner, Tim Stride, by my uh, dental school classmate. He called me. I was in the clinic one day in my practice. He said, hey, I met this guy, changed my life. And he wanted to sit down and talk with him. And this was back in 1997. And he, uh, he came up and met with me and he shared me through this, this process, this model that um, he uses to verify financial decision making. I'm like, oh, well, you know, in, in uh, orthodontics, we believe in evidence based uh, uh, dentistry. Well, why don't we believe in evidence based financial planning? And he goes, well, that's right. He goes, nobody actually believes in evidence based financial planning because if they did, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. I'm like, well, okay, well, that's interesting. So he showed me this model, and my wife and I and family, kids eventually uh, engaged it, and it was working so well. And Glenn, you're, we're the same age. 
we went through the dot com crash where you know everybody's you know millionaires the next day that the market crashed like crazy and I'm like hey you know our model just sort of just grew and did really well through that whole that whole time frame and my, and my buddies were just getting crushed in the market I'm like and by the way I'm just interrupting for a split second we're going to come yeah. back to that for people out there, and I know that the demographic of a lot of people who are listening right now are people who are probably between the ages of, oh, late 20s, 30-ish years of age, to maybe 45, give or take. That's the average. Doesn't mean there's not others listening who are older or younger, but the average bulk of folks who tune into entrepreneurs are, you know, millennials, a little bit older than millennials, you, you know, young Gen Xers, perhaps. But for those out there who've never weathered the, mm -hmm. the dot-com crash, it wasn't 2008. No. 2008, we've been through a few of these, you and me, Mark. Yeah, yeah right. But 2008 was seemed to be much more sudden, and it was more real estate driven through credit default swaps and all that other stuff uh, oh. that you can see in the in the Big Short. If nobody's watched it, you need to watch that movie. Got to watch it. Got to exactly. watch that movie because it explains it's it a good perfectly. Flick. It, it's so yeah. hard to follow, but it's true. But 2001, 2002 was a very different ball game because everybody was a millionaire. Everybody. Yeah. I, I was working in Seattle at the time as a general dentist. And I remember, because that was the center of it, right? That was Microsoft, was in Seattle, Washington, and, you know, yeah. Redmond. And I would have, I would have 22, 23, 24-year-old young men, and uh, typically young men, pulling up into my office in Ferraris, Lamborghinis, wanting full veneers, wanting uh, full mouth reconstructions, whatever it was. You know, I'm surprised they didn't ask for diamonds in their teeth. Um, <laughs> and, and literally, six months later, they were working at Sea First, you know, which was later bought out by Wamu, I think, which later went out of business because of the crash. It was remarkable to see the amount of wealth that was accumulated in such a yeah. short period of time. I'll throw out some names for you. You remember Lucent? Technology? Oh, yeah, totally. Global Crossing? You remember yeah. Global? Like, these were things that everybody invested Major. in. Major. Huge plays. And yeah. I think Global Crossing laid all the fiber optic pipe under the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, they did. Right? That's to right. Get to, yeah. to get to India, which made India a superpower eventually uh, in terms of the uh, IT world. But, yeah. but again, the point of all of this is you were talking about the crash. For those out there who've never experienced boom to bust overnight, yeah. um, until you've lived through it once and lived in Seattle when it happened, uh, it creates very, very innovative thinking if you want to keep your life going. And again, I, I, for a guy like you who's been through it, um, what word of caution would you give people today having lived through 2001 and watching some of the stuff that's going on that we'll talk about later with cryptocurrency, yeah. NFTs, uh, speculation, yeah. things like that? What, what advice would you offer people based on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that was a time that was unprecedented, right? And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the last 10 years has been an amazing run. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the younger demographics on this, on this podcast have really never experienced anything like that. And so you, you don't know how, how how fast your money can evaporate until you don't until you actually see it. And when you have to really position it in your most how would I say most efficient manner. And usually it's not all about just buying certain stocks and certain bonds. We believe in structured portfolios where you not only diversify those type things, but you diver, diversify all your assets, whether it's real estate, whether it's now now it's crypto, whether it's business angel investing, buying outside businesses and other uh, practices. Uh, bonds and there's a multitude of different things and it's not about the product itself it's how those products are structured together so it helps you insulate yourself against the, the the things that happen in all economies we know it's going to happen at some time in the future we just don't know when right and so if you position your assets in the, in the appropriate way you can sort of weather that storm yeah and as my friend who ran perot investments a small investment firm no, just, just a little one, just a small little one. <laughs> he said to me we never know when the next one's coming we never know how bad it's going to be they're all different that none, exactly none, right. none two are the same and we never know what it's going to happen so before i so rudely interrupted your story for that side discussion you were talking about how 2001 happened you were sitting with somebody yeah. talking and what happened next yeah and so as, as mentioned our, our model was was our plan was just really thriving and i and i told my my partner tim like you know tim Orthodontists and dentists are never exposed to the information that you've shared with me so seven, eight years ago. I go, would you mind if you know I helped you get this message out to my friends and colleagues in uh, in healthcare? And he says, well, you're going to get all your licenses and do all those things and get your registered investment advisor license and everything. And I said, all right. So back in 2004, that's when uh, we started our, our our company, Macro Wealth Management. And so that's that's been our company for 18 years now. And uh, you know, of course, we went through 08, and uh, that was a, a very difficult time. But uh, as mentioned to your, your comment before there, Glenn, about, you know, what do you do? When the market crashed in 2008, we didn't have anybody call us on the phone. 
about what am I going to do with my money? And I lost, you know, 20, 30, 40%. I'm like, because they didn't for one, but you know, two, they're like, they just knew the plan. When you have the plan in place, you can have an incredible peace of mind for the future. It's awesome. So, uh, and, and again, we think about 2008, which was obviously very sudden. I mean, it took a while, it was coming on for a while, but, yeah. and the warning signs were there, uh, as one could see. Well, remember the real estate, the real estate was insane. I mean, it was just booming. It's just, it was crazy where the real estate was, was going crazy. at that time. And, and for those who didn't watch the big short, it was dead on truthful for those of us. I mean, 2008 was what, 14 years ago. You know, I was 40 years old. I mean, I, I was already, I wasn't a kid anymore. And I had lots of friends who were making very modest middle income incomes who had five, six, eight, ten 10 rental houses, right? Yeah. They would get one, leverage it, get one, leverage it, get one, leverage it. And they couldn't afford the mortgage on any of them. And in that story, what was really interesting, great lesson was that if you remember the movie, The Big Short, which really, mm -hmm. again, it nailed it perfectly. They go to visit Florida. Spoiler alert, everybody. They, uh, <laughs> they go to visit Florida. And you remember they meet the strippers. And the strippers have like multiple rental homes. Yeah, that's right. right. That's and, right. And, and they're getting they're getting multiple rental homes through fake credit applications that these two real estate yahoos, or the bank loans officers are just pushing through. And, and it really was a scary time. And today, 14 years later, there are still people working who had to delay their retirements because their 401ks disappeared. And it was a, it was a really, most people here remember 2008. It's a horrible time. But do you mind? So, I mean, that, remember they had, there was a, like, no doc loans. Remember the whole no documentation loans. So oh, just put, you, put your name on it and here's 200,000 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I will tell you, I will publicly share this story with everybody because uh, it was such a different world. I remember the first year I owned my practice, which was 1997, was the first full year I owned my, my general dental practice. And um, I remember on April uh, 14th, which is an auspicious day if you think of taxes, I got a phone call from my accountant and he said, Glenn, great news. You had an amazing year, as the call always goes. And I said, it doesn't reflect in my bank account. He goes, no, but you paid off so much debt, so much principal. Da, da, da. And, and I knew the next line was, well, because I paid this all off, I owe tax on this stuff. And um, he says, good news is you had a great year, but you owe $62,000 <laughs> due the next day. Yeah. And, and, just, and just to explain to people what the world used to be like, if they don't remember it. And for many of us out there who remember this, you should nod your head when you hear it. I called my banker at Washington Mutual and I said, I just found out I own 62,000. And his response was, okay, great. Come on down, sign a loan. We'll give you $65,000. You can pay it off. Have a few extra thousand dollars and uh, just move on. And I went downtown Seattle, went to his office, signed the loan, got $62,000 or $65,000, paid my loan, and that was the end of it. Try that one today with a brand yeah, right. practice. Let me know how that would work out. It was, a, it was a different world, and we learned from it, thankfully. But talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about, you said people were losing 20, 30, 40, 60% of their portfolios, and yet those who were working with you guys were not. Are you at liberty to talk a little bit more in detail about what it was about your approach uh, and your partner's approach that was different, uh, that one should take away and learn from, uh, that allowed you to weather a storm where really it was catastrophic for most? Yeah. So when we look at things, we, we all, our model sort of broken down into five different components. And the top component is really the protection component, which is where you, you protect your assets, so to say. And that's the foundational piece. And so uh, that is always the, the stepping stone into the investments. And what typically happens is when people meet with advisors, the advisors always want to talk about the sexy stuff, like, you know, what, what, what stocks do I buy? What, what bonds do I buy? What do I put my retirement plan and so forth and so on. But if you don't start out with a foundational piece, you know, one little thing can happen, a car accident, a lawsuit, uh, and maybe a disability or, or anything can happen. If, if, if there's any chinks in that armor on the front end, your financial cash will come to a, a quick crash. Uh, I don't know, Blaine, you know, I had open heart surgery at age 45. I was born at the bad valve. I mean, I those types of those types of episodes in your life can change your financial picture very, very quickly. And so, you know, that's always our starting point. And then we always like to have a very good base of liquidity in place so that uh, when the market does crash, you can actually take action. You have a, you have a deep little dry powder. And so if you see the market going down, that's when you buy, right? And so you take advantage of the market when it goes down. When everybody's selling and you have cash on hand, you can deploy those monies in those areas that, you know, they're still good companies. They just, they just get caught up in the, the economy at the time. 
And so then, you know, when we have the dry powder to do that, then our investment side, the structured portfolios, we really don't go out there and buy individual stocks. We have a, we have Nobel Prize winning research behind all the decisions we make for our structured portfolios from a stock and bond standpoint. Although stock, I mean, bonds now are very weak, but still over time, it sort of helps mitigate some of the risk. And so uh, uh, we have diversified portfolios across the entire world. And it, that's, that's more of a rabbit hole discussion. Yeah. But, well, you know, what happens is, yeah, but when, when, you, when you sort of tilt your portfolios, there are certain parameters in everybody's investment life that actually have shown to garner more, more rate of return. If you tilt your portfolios to small cap value, that's sort of like the, uh, uh, the tilt that, you know, the value way is the Warren Buffett way, so to say. Yeah. And uh, through momentum and profitability, if you just take all the same stocks and you tilt them a little bit towards that, you'll squeeze out some additional rate of return that's above and beyond, quote, indexing that a lot of people do. And there's nothing wrong with index. And an index can be very, very powerful, but you'll never be better than index minus your fees. So you try to sort of yeah. overcome the market rate you turn by, by um, squeezing out that with that tilt. And you, and you threw a lot of really good terms in there that I think at another time we can talk about. Yeah, right. You know, whether, I know. It's, whether it's it, tilt, small cap. I mean, there's there's some great index funds. Like there's so much great stuff yeah. in there. We can talk about it another time. But yeah. here's a broad question for you. And I know, you know, you always used to hear was Harry Truman said he wanted to have a one, one-armed economist, right? Because <laughs> on the other hand, they always say, oh, but on the other hand. So I'm going to yeah. ask you, I'm gonna, I know you're not an economist, but I'm going to ask you a simple question that maybe have a complex answer, but I don't think it will. Would you disagree, or let me make it easier, would you agree with the statement, generally speaking, this is not financial advice, okay, we're being crystal clear with people, we're just having a discussion, but would you agree with the comment that right now would be a very good time to have lots of cash on hand, or would you say that now's a really good time to have everything invested? I always love having a lot of cash on hand, but I think if you're going to invest it, I think you have to invest more towards, in this high inflation environment, tilt those that cash towards hard assets, whether it's real estate, uh, whether it's crypto collectibles or, or collectibles yeah right well you know there'll be good nfts right and so the um the, the hard asset space is is one of the best ways to uh, overcome this this inflation that we're all experiencing now and so um, as long as you always keep a decent amount of cash on hand for emergencies and stuff yeah. uh, then you can deploy those assets to you know you take you know cash on hand slow money but you want to turn that slow money into faster money by you know using it in those areas that are you know, hopefully overcome the uh, the economy at hand. And obviously, in some economies, the stocks are better. But, you know, we're in the environment now that the hard assets are better. So let's talk about hard assets, because um, I would love to dive in just a little bit. Define for those out there what a hard asset is. Yeah, so the, there's different types of assets. There's paper assets, like bonds and stocks. And hard assets are more tangible, right? And so hold them, feel them, see them. And uh, so, you know, real estate's obviously, it, that's a hard asset. And you live in it, you can, you, you rent it, you can own it, you can charge people for it. And same thing with your businesses. That's it's, an income, very, it's, it's an income producing asset. They're, they're all, you know, these are all potentially income producing assets. And Uncle Sam, I mean, they love, Uncle Sam loves hard assets and they give you some of the best tax benefits to be owners of hard assets. You, when you own your own business, it's the most powerful drawer in our model. And Uncle Sam loves small business owners. It's the, it's, it's, it's the fabric of our country. And so they, they will give you tax benefits to be a, a business owner. And the same token with real estate. They want you to own real estate because you, you build stuff, you buy appliances, you, you furnish the homes. It's really good for our economy. So um, hard assets are a very a valuable place. And Uncle Sam realizes that. And so um, when you can touch and feel it, then people like that value. Collectibles, gold, you know, that's a hard asset. Boom. Silver, boom. You can feel it, touch it and, and, and hold it. So that's and, and so is you know I, I I'm almost embarrassed to say it out loud, but so is the original copy of Super Mario Brothers that I own, right? Like, <laughs> no, but, saying, but like, yeah. but I, I will tell you uh, without naming names or telling people, you know, I'll talk to people about cryptocurrency, and we'll get into that in just a second. We'll talk about NFTs uh, in just a second uh, because I know you and I have had a lot of discussions about those. But you know, I have a friend who once bought a Magic the Gathering card. Right, he he played the game a ton when he was younger. He knows what he's doing. He knows the market. He knows it's like the second rule of the richest man in Babylon, which everybody needs to read. 1927, Classen, I think Scott Classen. It's a classic book you need to read. The rule totally. number two is that invest only in things you really know or have somebody who can who really knows it. And he knows magic, and he bought a card that he sold for 10x in probably a one year time frame. And we're talking when he bought it, it was already five figures. So we're not talking about a hundred dollar card he sold for a thousand, 
But my yeah. point is, if you know these areas well, if you played Pokemon a mm -hmm. ton as a kid, there is a Pokemon card explosion right now. So if you know what to, to look for, Charizard, you know, hologram, I'm going to throw out words that nobody out there is going to understand. But if you, <laughs> if you know what to look for, and again, I try to dive into these things to learn because they're all opportunities. And what my yeah. friend taught me, he said, is, look, if you have some commercial real estate, if you've got some residential real estate that you're investing in, if you have Magic the Gathering cards, if you get Super Mario Brothers, if you got gold, you get the more segments or sectors you get into, uh, a, the more protected you are, and B, yeah. the more fun it gets in many respects. I totally agree on that. I mean, it's, it's one of, that's one of our concepts of money. It's, you know, it's, it's one thing to have money, but you want to be able to spend and enjoy it. Money is of no use if you can't spend and enjoy it, or at least, you know, visualize it. And we have clients who are, you know, as you mentioned, comic book collectors. We've got art collectors, car collectors. I mean, it's, but you can enjoy those. You can actually, you know, have fun with them and, and experience, exactly. experience your money at the same time. And that's, that's, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Yep. And I tell people, um, again, not financial advice per se, but I tell everybody, if there's something you're passionate about that nobody else knows about or something that you can really deep dive into, and at nine o'clock at night when the family's asleep, you want to jump on the computer and learn more about this stuff because you enjoy it, there might be a financial opportunity there. Um, I was recently told about bourbons, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows about Pappy Van Winkle and all the stuff that went on with Buffalo Trace and what have you. But you know, high-end bourbon or high-end liquors, you know, there are people out there buying them right now, uh, holding them as investments. And we're talking 10, 20, $30,000 bottles that are going up really big, really quickly. So if you're a bourbon fan, you can do this stuff. If you like Pokemon and you know it better than the next person, there was, did you ever, there was a great um, Real Sports with Bar Brian Gumbel on HBO. He has this mm -hmm. great, and he, he had an episode, I think in 2020, I think 2021, about he interviewed a kid from Long Island, where I'm from, who's like a typical Long Island Jewish kid like me. He was like 18 years old, and his parents let him use some of his bar mitzvah money, like $5,000, to go buy cards, like trading cards, uh, sports cards. And now I think he has a $3 million collection a couple of years later because he, he leveraged it. He knew it well, and he leveraged it. And so I'm just saying this out there, and I did do a, a podcast on it once myself, that if there's something out there that you're passionate about that you love, there's probably an opportunity there. And the good news is um, I saw a lecture at, at MKS about five years ago from a couple of orthodontists who were involved in real estate. And they said something very, very poignant. It, they said, you may never get rich being an orthodontist, but you will have enough disposable income that could help make you rich. And, and theirs was so about true. investing in real estate. And I, again, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, I, I, I totally agree. I was actually at that same meeting with you. It's, uh, and that I was, that was, do you remember? And I, yeah, I knew their names. And I reached out to them. and They're not really lecturing much anymore. And no, I told them if they ever lecture again, I want them at Summit. But do you yeah. remember they started with one piece of land like off the side of a highway? Next yeah. thing you knew, they owned Mega. everything around the mall. You remember? <laughs> every, they owned literally every store around the mall was theirs. Uh, and I think it, it was, was like a Monopoly board. Monopoly board just like, like oh, oh, owning, all, owning all the hotels in the Monopoly board. It's true, but, but the lesson to learn from that was that no matter what you do, and we'll, and we'll get into crypto and NFT, is that let's say you buy an NFT for two Ethereum, which right now stands at around $3,000 per token per se, that's $6,000. Well, if you can get that to go to $9,000, which is not unreasonable in today's day and age, if you pick the right one, sell it, take your $9,000 and invest in other tokens or what have you. Yeah, you, totally. could take, you could take $6,000. I'm going to ask you this. Here's a tough one for you, Mart. Let's blow some people's minds out there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Again, is it possible, and I'm going to say possible, I'm not going to say one in a million chance, but is it plausible that if you knew your homework and followed things really closely, you could take $6,000 in crypto and grow it to $50,000 in six months. Oh yeah, that's okay. definitely true. Okay, just for people out there who aren't in this world, yeah. is it plausible? Now plausible. granted, it's plausible you could lose all your money, right? Yep. It's plausible, but is it plausible that you could take $6,000 and turn into $100,000 in six months? It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Could it you is. take $6,000 and turn it into a quarter million dollars in six months? It is, actually. Yeah. I mean, the it's joke plausible. Is, it's plausible. And, and my question to you is, do you know more than one person who's done that in the last year? I do, actually. Exactly. Yeah. That's my point. So, so, yeah. We know so, yeah, so many people who've taken maybe, you know, the numbers are bigger, but I know more than a few people, more than a few, who took mm -hmm. $25,000 in cryptocurrency and turned it into half a million dollars. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I've never, you know, I've been doing crypto for a long time, but I've never seen an asset class 
do this in this in this capacity to your to your point. Um, and, and by it's, the way, it's all it's all going to crash and go away, right? Cryptocurrency is done after 2022, right, Mark? It is early in the game, my friends. I know. I, I just, <laughs> and that's the weird I, thing about it. We just we've only just started. I mean, it is like only 200 million people ish even in cryptocurrency, even around the whole world. And you know, we have billions of people. This is just the start. Yeah, but because there's so few people involved, Mart, it's got to crash, right? It, it's not going to hang around. It's just it's just a trend. It's like Beanie Babies, right? People are in it. It's going to go away. There's no value long term in cryptocurrency, right? I mean, there was more messaging than that a couple of years ago, and now all the big boys are getting involved. Wall Street and the big institutions are getting fully engaged, and they don't get fully engaged if they don't think there's something to it. And so, when they see the potential fees going out the window out of their out of their stock and bond portfolios, and moving all over to cryptocurrency, yeah, it's going to be volatile, as you mentioned. Yeah. It can go up and down like crazy. Nothing. You have to have some uh, some pretty, you know. Strong, strong. Cool, you know, cool yons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, you have to, have <laughs> to, cool uh, to manage some of the volatility. But it's, you know, people who first get into the game, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. I'm like, there's nothing to freak out about. You're, you're going to be fine. There's a great commercial on TV. Have you seen that one where the guy's like, I'm a millionaire. And like, next thing he's like, I'm broke. <laughs> no, I'm a millionaire. And like, they go back and forth. He's Because it's like a 25-year-old kid. Who, yeah. And at the end of it, I think it's crypto.com. And, yeah. and, and I think the best advice I'd give anybody is pick some winners early on. Don't spend more money than you can afford to lose completely. And, yeah. and don't watch it every day. Just put it aside. Right. Let it go. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. But to the point you made before, there's so few people involved in it. And yeah. yet, and yet, globally, right now, as of this minute, in February of 2022, there is over $2 trillion U.S. dollars invested as the market cap yeah. in, in cryptocurrency. Two trillion dollars people not millions not billions but trillions did you you know i, I don't know if you know this number Mar. how much money is invested in bitcoin alone in fiat or regular paper money in, in u.s dollars how much money do you think is in bitcoin alone as of the moment of this right now i think it's just a tick under a trillion you are dead on, my friend. As Johnny yeah. Carson would say, Ver y y you are correct, sir. Um, it's, right, it's, that, was, that was my Karnak. That was my Karnak. Karn you're, you're dating yourself now. <laughs> $823 billion is in Bitcoin alone. Ethereum has $372 billion in it. That's over $1.1 trillion in Bitcoin and Ethereum only. Now, now, Unlike that's most, like nothing, by the way. I mean, no, in the world of the world we live in, it's like nothing. Right, but it's not money that's insignificant. It's not as if there's five right. million dollars in cryptocurrency and it's going to go away tomorrow. To make exactly to make one point one trillion dollars disappear overnight uh, is is challenging. And and I think I just had a discussion with a good friend before we got on here. It's un, it's important for people to understand what cryptocurrency is. It's not. It's not money the way we think of money. It's a token that's utilized on a network. Did you wanna did you wanna talk a little bit about that? Is it something you feel comfortable discussing a little bit about what is a Bitcoin? What is so people understand better? Yeah, I, I, I love the discussion. I mean, Bitcoin is nothing really more than a decentralized digital currency. And it was really the first of its kind. And so when people say decentralized, the beauty of that whole mechanism is, is that in the history of money, uh, money has always been somewhat centralized. And so uh, whether it's seashells, uh, cows, uh, gold coins, silver coins, uh, dollars, it's or, or, or gold, it's always been debased through time. And so whenever you debase any type of money, the, the money gets gets cheaper or not worth as much. And so and it, and it happened in America until 1971 when, uh, when we went off the gold standard. Our money used to be backed by the dollar and by the gold. The dollar was backed by the gold. And after 1971, no longer it was no longer the case. And so uh, ever since that time, the government the, the discontinues printing money out of thin air, and, and, and the printing press has has gone on and on and on. In the last 18 months, they've printed almost the entire money supply. And the reason why people talk about inflation is, is because it is what it is. But Bitcoin was created to overcome that in 2009. After the market crash in 2008, a gentleman named or an anonymous person, Satoshi they. Nakamoto. Don't uh, call it. It's they, right? It's they. It's a they. And created this hard money that it's it, it, it's it cannot be debased and when you can't debase the currency it holds its value and so and therein lies the the, the power of bitcoin because we know there will only be 21 million ever uh, created or mined and at, at the time there's um 18 19 million that have been created up to this date and so 
people see that they say, all right, I want to put money here because I know it's going to hold my value. Whereas my dollars, I'm losing seven per seven, I guess, as of yesterday, seven and a half percent, yeah, 7.5% on a yearly basis. I mean, you're going backwards in any type of uh, uh, environment where you're not overcoming that inflation, like even wage inflation. I know in our practices, Glenn, you know, people are wanting increased wages and they've actually gotten increased wages, oh, yes. but they're still, not, they're still not overcoming inflation itself. They can get a 5% raise, but it's still not good enough. Nope. They're so, still, their dollars to spend at home uh, are less today if we give them a 5% raise. If we raise our fees by 5%, Technically, our spending power of the money we make in our practice, all things equal, is less than it was last year this time. Yeah. Because yeah, inflation yeah. was 7.5%. And, but, yeah. but the point with, bit, with, with cryptocurrency that's worth mentioning is it's independent of governments. Yeah. It's independent of banks. Now, that's a great thing because a guy living in Bangladesh can potentially have the same economic opportunity financially with, a, with Bitcoin as somebody living in the United States. The government can't come in and take their Bitcoin. The government can't say suddenly, we're going to start printing tons of money like Venezuela or you think pre-World War II Hindenburg, Germany. Germany, Germany right? yeah. You, like where you take a wheelbarrow full of cash. The, mm -hmm. the val and you and I have had lots of discussions and we won't go down the rabbit hole about my feelings that inflation does touch them because the things we buy and the goods we purchase when we cash out Bitcoin and the fiat still are touched by inflation. But when, the day, but when the day comes that ultimately everybody in the world is using digital currency, which will happen at some point, it because, will. you know, um, America is a very small part of the world and the rest of the world, people are yearning for decentralized currency. It's going to be a very different world when that happens. When I go fill up my car with Bitcoin, uh, not with Bitcoin, but using yeah. Bitcoin to, you know, to do it. And the downside of it, which is very important for people to understand if they're going to invest in it, is um, when you put your ATM card in an ATM machine and it says $500 and you only got $400, what do you do? You pick up the phone and you dial 1-800-EAT-CRAP. Oh, I'm sorry, Bank of America's <laughs> number. Sorry. Um, you, you, dial, you, you pick up the phone and you call Bank of America or whoever your bank is um, and you say, hey guys, there's $500 that said came out, but it only took $400. Can you please look into this? And they say, sure. And they do an investigation. When you do that on on decentralized currency, there is nobody to call. There is no that's the There's no customer service. Exactly. There's nobody to talk to. So, you know, the, the rule of thumb is, for instance, if I want to transfer a a thousand dollars from one account of mine to another account, one wallet to another, you know to memorize the numbers you're sending to and to send out a test. Send out a hundred dollars always first. To send a little, out $10 bit, little bit first. Yeah. To make sure it goes, which which can be unsettling, especially when you're new to it and all the warning signs pop up on your screen. Uh, it can be very, very scary. And yeah, you so, lose uh, hair. You see this? You lose hair. When you, <laughs> and stressful piece is like... You were 18 it, years old when you started this last year. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I had but, a big, big head of hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, cryptocurrency and NFTs. And, and I don't want to get into the big details because we don't have a ton of time. But, but cryptocurrency and NFTs as a part of a portfolio, right? You said... Yeah. Hard assets are a fair part of, and, and again, I would argue whether or not crypto and NFTs are really hard assets, right? But, but do you and, and your partner, does your firm advise people to have a little bit of cryptocurrency in their, in their portfolios? Yeah, absolutely. There is a research paper that came out a couple of years ago by a group in San Francisco called Bitwise, and they, uh, they, they proved they did portfolio construction between 60, 40 portfolios and adding a little bit of Bitcoin to it, 1%, 2%. And what they found is to your point, you don't need to you know, put your whole house into Bitcoin, but if you just put a very small piece of the puzzle of, of cryptocurrency in this, in this particular research paper was, uh, was Bitcoin, what it found was is that it, it doubled your rate of return by having that in the portfolio. But at the same time, most, and most importantly, the standard deviation or the volatility around that um, decision was the same. So that's powerful because now you're saying, well, there's no reason not to have a little bit of Bitcoin because if the risk is the same and my rate of return goes double that, then there's no reason not to have a little piece of that action in your portfolio. Yeah. And it's really that sort of, that gets back to evidence-based uh, uh, financial advice because we want to make sure that we can sort of substantiate our recommendations. And we just started our the first crypto fund, I think, in dentistry uh, about six, eight months ago, we partnered with a group out of Indianapolis where people, you know, they can actually have Bitcoin in their portfolios without having to do all the all the worry things that we talked about here where, you know, remember all the passphrases and stuff, because just a little bit, you know, you can go to, you know, we can talk about it a minute, going to Coinbase, getting your own account set up is it's not hard to do, but there, there are some machinations in there that sort of have to be taken care of.
Yeah, and sometimes you're centralizing decentralized finance. There yeah, are, you are. There, are. there are companies that do have customer service departments and what yep. have you, and, and yep. Coinbase is one of them, and, and I've dealt with them, and it's a very safe place to, to do your first it trade. Is. There are many yep. good safe places to say, hey, I, I'm going to go onto their website or open their app, and I'm going to click the button buy, yep. and I'm going to invest money from my bank account, and it takes central, it takes decentralized and makes it centralized, but again- yep. That's another discussion. But for a million dollar portfolio, 2% means $20,000. That's, yeah. that's a fair amount of money. It um, is. So my other question for you is right now, can you give me, I know you wrote a book, right? Mm -hmm. Your, mm -hmm. what is it called? Your, your retirement great, smile. Your retirement smile. I read it. It's a great book. So I'm going to tell everybody, that's what first piqued my, I knew Mart from online. I saw his name. I didn't know anything about him. And then I read that book and I said, this guy thinks differently. Like, I really like the way, he, there's books you read every now and then where you see things that make you think differently and go, wow, this person's thinking outside the box. And so, A, how does somebody get a copy of it if they want it? Yeah. Yeah. And if anybody wants, I'll give you a copy. Um, they can reach out to me personally at my my email or you can text me. My email is mark at macro-wealth.com. Say it one or, time. Mark, Mark M -A -R -T, M -A -R -T, M -A -R -T at macro, M-A-C-R-O hyphen wealth. Dot com. Dot I e. email. I'm sorry. Dot I need e. to get. I, I, I do. I do need a dot e. You got to go to e n s, my friend, and go download an e. I, I got to anyway. get, <laughs> get that man. So yeah, if they want a copy, I'll, I'll send them a copy, or you can text me my 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 cells eight. Or find him on Facebook. He's always there too. I'm on Facebook all the time. I, I think you have a small group in Facebook, don't you? Not, it's not so small. Yeah, a little group. Yeah, Crypto Doctors. They can go to Facebook, learn a little uh, about crypto. I, I, I love that engagement. And um, I just love sharing this information because I do I do believe it's the future. And uh, it's, uh, it's, in a, it's it's a very exciting space. But, you know, thanks, Glenn, for, for the uh, mention of the book. And I said, if anybody wants, we all send them a, a copy. Yeah, and I appreciate your posts. I mean, I always engage with your posts because they're speaking you do. to the choir. Uh, there's so much great information out there. And the best part is you don't take um, a financial position in it. You just state the information and say, this yeah. is, look what just came out today and look what's happening here. And, and again, neither you nor I would ever want to push somebody into a space that they're uncomfortable going into. But right. I do think, you know, like, you know, you, you, the, you, you run a bath and the water's boiling hot. And you're not sure if you should just jump in, dip your toe in a little bit, you know, is the water yeah. too hot? Is it, or, you know, can I survive this? And really again, good I, advice. Really I, good advice. I have to say when I trade crypto, it's so much fun. It's yeah. just, it's so much fun to, and, and, and again, you and I talked beforehand, don't, aside from the one or 2% you're putting into your fund, if you're going to take side money and throw it in there, you have to go into it with the idea that I could lose every penny of this money. Yeah. And it's okay. If you've got that money and you want to play around, whether it's $100, $1,000, or $100,000, or a million dollars, just yeah. know you're not probably not going to lose all of it, but you could. And the big difference that I talk to people about with NFTs versus cryptocurrency is that if you buy, uh, let's just say you buy one ETH, right? One token of Ethereum, uh, which is $3,000, $3,100. If the market crashes, like it did in December, right? And things yeah. really drop tremendously, uh, you might, that $3,000 token you purchased, you might sell for $1,500 or, or $1,000 or $1,200. But when you buy an NFT, which we won't get into big right now, if the market for that particular NFT crashes, you may not be able to sell it at all. You may lose right. every, every penny you put on it. So again, I tell people that cryptocurrency is kind of like, it's speculative. It's very, very risky. And it's kind of like um, just walking up to your friend who's Russian and taking an, a bottle that he had uh, and he says, drink this, drink this, you'll like this. And you drink it. You don't know what's right. going to really happen, but he's your friend, so you kind of trust yeah. him. So yeah. I tell people that NFTs are like traveling through the backwoods of like Thailand or somewhere, you're backpacking, and you stumble across a bottle sitting on the floor, and you're like, yeah. it's a cool looking bottle. I think I should drink what's in here. And <laughs> either, you know, yeah. you're going to fly off to an amazing place mm. and enjoy your journey, or you could be dead. Uh, it's it's one of the other. No, it's right. Well, NFT, the whole NFT thing is it was like cryptocurrency years ago. It's the wild west right now. It is the wild west, and it's just booming. But and it's a very exciting uh, uh, place to be. But it, it is definitely risk riskier than even having just some basic Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah, it definitely is. And and the the problem I apologize is we've spent so much good time talking about things. We don't have a lot of time left. But um, I do want to mention one thing. I the first time I met you in person is when we met at the Smile Doctors annual conference. Yep. Um, again, uh, you know, you partner with Smile Doctors, I partner with Smile Doctors. And, and on another conversation, when we have more time, I'd love to get into your 
your experience with them because you partnered at time a couple of years ago before they uh, allowed as much autonomy as they do today. Uh, right. But, but the one thing I do want to bring up in the last minute or two we have is um, people are so focused on, on accumulating their money that oftentimes they don't really worry so much about distributing their money. And um, if you want to take a minute or two and just talk about that, I know that um, people would really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's why we wrote our book, quite frankly, because you know everybody talks about the accumulation of the asset, but rarely when we meet people that has, they, their advisors ever talk about, how am I going to get my money out and distribute it so that I can live my retirement life to its fullest extent? And so people should never really take a pay cut in retirement. They, whatever their income is prior to retirement should be relatively the same in retirement. And unfortunately, the, the ADA research shows that almost every orthodontist and dentist will take about a 50% pay cut uh, when they get to that point of retirement. And so the objective, of course, is to say, you know, how am I going to take these assets and all the different things they can do for me? And how do I create the most potential income in the future right? and with some built-in guarantees? And so um, if you haven't, for all of you out there, if you've not spoken to your advisor on it, you should, you know, that, that's, that's a talking point immediately. It's like, how am I going to yeah. turn this mountain of assets into an income stream when I get to retirement? And um, it's a critical piece. You know, people look at those, the phases of wealth building, accumulation, during your working years and distribution, retirement years, and then preservation when you pass on through estate planning. But in reality, all the decisions are the exact same at the exact time. So, you know, when you're making an investment retirement plan, you have to know all three phases at the same time because it's a dynamic, dynamic, dynamic model. And, and as I said earlier, um, I have no financial interest whatsoever with Mart or his companies of any kind. But reading his book, listening to the way he talks has really piqued my interest. And I'm certainly going to be spending some time with him uh, learning mm -hmm. about how maybe we can move forward myself. Uh, awesome. just, I'm not endorsing. I'm just saying I'm going to try it myself. And and I think it's worth uh, do you, how when people come to you if they want to talk to you. How does the conversation begin typically? Does it do they have to fly out somewhere? Is it a Zoom call? Uh, what is the first interaction like? Yeah, well, pre Zoom it was personal interaction, but now we rarely actually get in front of people. So many times, like meetings, like your meeting or other orthodontic meetings across the country, that's when the personal engagement comes in, in the fray because we have, now we have clients in over 30 some odd states, 35 states, I think. And so, you know, getting together on a one-to-one -one basis is is nearly impossible. So almost full engagement is through uh, Zoom or go to meeting. And um, people are, COVID actually made it so much easier for people to sort of, you know, make it more reasonable to do, you know, that sometimes people didn't want to necessarily meet by Zoom, but now it's, it's kind of a normal protocol. So it, it makes it very easy uh, people can, you know, just flip on their computer and be like me sitting across the table from them. Right on. Well, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mart, for being yeah. here. Can True pleasure. Us, can you give us that email address one more time? Mart at? Yeah. Mart at uh, macro, M-A-C-R-O hyphen wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H dot com. If nothing else comes from this, I encourage every person to get his book. It's free. Read it. It's got some great ideas in there. I think you're very generous in what you shared. And um, again, I, 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 it's always fun talking to an orthodontist who has a secondary story and some great stuff going on. And I want to say thank you to you from the bottom of my heart for all you're doing out there to give up your time and energy just in the crypto space for orthodontists. Okay. I love it. And I, you know, and I believe the more people have you know, this type of information, it's better for society, better for our, our, our people. And so um, it's, it, it's and that's one of the beauty things about crypto, too, because it is kind of freedom in, in the end. Well, thank you, Mart. I really appreciate you. And, and, and just want to say thank you on behalf of everybody again for being here today. Very welcome, Glenn. Thanks a bunch.